Hi, everybody, and welcome to another tracker webinar. Today, our theme is the art of the influencer brief. As you all know, a great brief is deceptively difficult to create, which is why we partnered with advocacy marketing expert and founder of Happy Cat Agency, ben Geo Redford. West, to break down the art of the influencer brief with you live. Geo has spent the last decade working with influencers in top tier brands, including Charlotte Tilbury, Benefit, and L'Oreal. She will explain how to best communicate your brand's needs and expectations to your influencer partners, enabling their creativity and your brand to shine. Hi, Gio. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So happy to have you. My name is Mackenzie Newcomb. I'm the influencer marketing manager at Tracker, and I'm actually soon to be a full-time content creator and influencer myself, which is why I volunteered to co-host this webinar today. So we timed this webinar to be just under 40 minutes. So we hope to have time to answer three to five questions after, but we invite you to use the chat box in the interim to share your thoughts as we go. We have quite a few tracker reps in here that hopefully should be able to answer some of your questions as well. Yeah, and please do ask as many questions as possible. I think this is quite an interactive topic and there are a lot of opinions and people might have a lot of varying experience. So I'd love to see people's thoughts on any of these topics that we're going to cover today. And I guess we'll just launch right in. So uh, as Mackenzie teed up, there are a lot of common missteps in the process of brands briefing influences for campaigns, which is what we're going to dissect today. And the outcome of a poorly written brief, which I'm sure some of you have experienced, we all have, the key messaging hasn't translated to your influencer or even worse to your customer. The expectations haven't been met from both sides and then the blame game starts which will then start to damage the relationships that you've worked so hard to build if we focus instead on making sure that briefs play to the strength of both parties contain only the key information required and are protecting everyone legally which we'll have a whole section on then we'll set ourselves up for meaningful and successful campaigns so setting ourselves up for success before we enter the briefing stage, there are some things that we want to already have in place. No work should begin without a signed contract. Contracts, hopefully you will know, protect everybody involved in the campaign. They can be referred back to in the event of a discrepancy. So before you even get to the point of giving a brief to your influencer, make sure that everybody's signed and agreed on the contract. All the parties need to be clear on what the basics are that are expected from this campaign. So what the product is, what the life period is, and what is the process for review. We want to avoid as few surprises as possible once we get to the briefing stage. And we need to define what it is that we want to achieve from this brief. Hopefully, you've already decided on the campaign objectives far before even the contract was agreed. Um, but some people will do launch into contracts without fully defining what it is that they want to achieve from that campaign and from collaborating with that influencer. So if you haven't yet completely nailed that and decided that internally, now is the time to do that before you write this brief. So a system that most people hopefully will be familiar with from your school days, uh, the basics of any brief is who, when, where, what, why, and how. And these, again, should be agreed in advance of the contracts being signed. So the expectations of the partnership have been mutually agreed way before you get to the briefing phase. But we're going to dissect each one of these so that it's clear on what we mean when we say, you know, have these in mind. Starting out with who, and this is really where Tracker comes into play. So the key to a great brief is partnering with the right people who don't need extended briefs or inspiration. So who should you be working with? You can use Tracker to search for influencers who are already talking about your brand. If they're already hyping you up for free and posting about it, they're definitely going to be willing to hype you up for pay. And they're probably actually hoping that you'll notice and offer and planning to offer to work together anyways. Per usual, you're going to want to check out their profile on Tracker to see if they are flagged for using any keywords or terms that you listed. Um, as always, we really recommend reviewing what these pieces of content are for context. So here you can see how our influencer discovery works. This is what you're, when you're going to want to make sure that you have an ideal audience and you want to look at their gender, engagement rate, and geographical makeup of their following, among other data points we gather in Tracker. If they're a perfect match in all these places, they'll probably be a really great partner for you. 
We found the right people for the campaign, but now we need to decide and not dictate when that content is going to go live. You as a business understand your funnel, so the conversion of your customers and the journey that it takes to get them there, that you know that that's better than um, on some, some days in the month compared to others. So for example, it could be the five days after payday weekend um, is normally when you see the most conversion on your websites. So take that into consideration to determine when the campaign period is. But when you're actually getting down to kind of the micro of which days and which times within that campaign period you want the content to go live, this is where you need to start working with your influencer collaboratively. So here you can see some real back end insights from some different Instagram profiles. If you were going live with Influencer One at 9am, you can see that that would perform really well. But just because it worked really well going live with them at 9am doesn't mean that the same thing would happen with Influencer Two. In fact, actually, that's one of their lowest performing times and 9pm would be much better to go live. Similarly, for Influencer Three, you can see that Friday performs really well for them. Their audience is super engaged and active. The content's going to fly on a Friday. Uh, but using that insight and applying it to a five, you can see that actually it wouldn't perform very well at all on a Friday compared to some of their other days. So you can't just apply the same logic from one influencer to another. By showing an influencer that you value the access to these insights, um, you'll be able to see, you know, they'll be willing to share it with you and then you'll be able to see when the content is going to perform better for that particular influencer. And you'll have to do this for every single one in the campaign if you want to make sure that it's going to perform best and going to resonate with their audience the best. And you need to do that together. It can't be dictated. Definitely consider when, when you're talking about your outreach. So if you want these desirable times, you're going to want to book influencers out as far as possible so you can secure these key dates and times and you're not competing with their other partners for them. Yes, definitely. And then in the same breath, the where, where the content is going, you need to listen to the influencer's guidance on which channels and platforms are performing best in your product category for them at the moment. You know, something that worked really well for them a couple of weeks ago might not be working as well now. Something like a TikTok that went viral that you worked on with one influencer wouldn't necessarily go viral with another influencer. It might even be that the influencer you're working with has a really high performing TikTok, but you're a skincare brand and they know that their skincare content performs much better on YouTube. You need to work with them to gain these insights. And again, by showing them that you value those insights, they're more likely to kind of collaborate with you and you can work together to define exactly where the content should live. What you also want to take into consideration is the functionality of the platform. So if what your objective is to drive traffic to your website, then what you need is a link and you wouldn't be able to get that from an Instagram feed post. It would have to be a stories or a blog post or a YouTube post with a link in the caption, for example. So think about what functionality you need in order to get the objective that you're trying to reach. On that note, if you want influencers to cross post content from TikTok to Reels, you want to make sure that you're having them remove the watermark to increase their post's potential impact. So Instagram has finally shared the key to getting high engagement and taking advantage of that algorithm. Uh, I hate the word, but, it, but it's, it's haunted us for years, right? Uh, but they've also explicitly shared that they are not going to promote content with the TikTok watermark. As someone who went viral for an hour cross-posting on Instagram and then had immediately no more views and same thing happened with Geo, believe Instagram, believe what they're telling you and make sure that your influencers are removing that watermark. Yes, definitely. <laughs> So this one uh, probably seems like quite an obvious one, but I feel like this is where a lot of brands fall down and overcomplicate things. Your brief needs to contain the what, and that what is the product and its benefits, the key messages of the campaign, and that's it. Maybe the brand story if it's relevant, but honestly, like sending lengthy press releases and brand or product origin stories, uh, more than a couple of sentences, if it's not relevant, it's gonna dilute the messaging, it's gonna make it so much more confusing for the influencer to translate the message from the brand to their audience. And then it will be more difficult for the audience to understand exactly what the point of the content is and what the purpose of the product is. 
Gio, what is an example of a time in which a brand would want to share their origin story? So th- yeah, there definitely are times where it would be relevant to share the origin story, even if it is, you know, a small, concise version of it and not the, you know, the full press release version that you're sending to print. But for example, Charlotte Tilbury, where I used to work, um, Charlotte develops all of her products backstage with, um, you know, as a professional makeup artist with her legacy, with all of her celebrity clients um, and the products that she develops, you know, she spent maybe 10, 15 years on some of them before they get to the point where she's really ready to release them to market. So that's relevant because her legacy, the development of that product and her kind of reputation in that market is very relevant to the product that she's launching um, but not every brand that has a founder story is necessarily specifically relevant to that product launch and to be honest it sounds really harsh but a lot of people don't care um, as much as you do about these origin stories or about um, you know the trekking to the Himalayas and finding a leaf and it reminded you of the time that you like all of that is it's great for you to tell um, as a brand, but it's maybe not something that you want your influencers to be sharing as part of their content. I love that. I'd also add that some um, Americans love to know when things are made in the USA. A simple hashtag made in the USA will will do. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like as long as it's clear, um, you don't need to know exactly where you source the the cotton fibers and all of that. Like, And that's something that, yeah, the brand should tell and not necessarily the influencer. So the next thing that we want to include in our briefs is the why, um, specifically why should the customer care about this campaign or this piece of content? Is the product brand new? Do you have a limited offer on? You know, is it that um, they need to care about it right now because it's going to be 50% off for the next 48 hours? It's been proven that campaigns with enticing incentives see much greater returns. Um, And it sounds obvious, but a lot of brands invest quite a lot in influencer content, but then there's no like incentive to get that customer to participate and push them down that consumer funnel. It's the same as every other marketing channel. Customers need a reason to directly react. And also you're more likely to get those immediate results and kind of be able to measure the direct impact of the influencer content if you're encouraging customers to shop then and there as opposed to wait you know screenshotting it or sending it to their boyfriend and then maybe in two weeks time they'll go back and have a look you want them to interact right now I love it you should also be able to answer why about why you chose specific influencers for this campaign it's a lot of a lot of reasons to ask yourself why yes always be asking why why am I doing why am I here (laughs) what am I doing (laughs) Okay, and then talking about this funnel. So hopefully you're all aware of the consumer purchasing funnel. Um, We all know that influencer marketing is typically upper funnel. So um, we need to include along with the why should they care about the content is how do they actually interact with the content and the campaign and the brand in general. We need a clear call to action to drive the customer through this purchasing funnel. And also we need to ensure that we're asking the influencer to give them what they need in order to prep their audience. So, you know, is it a link that they need in order to swipe up? Is it um, the right handles so that they can send their customers to your brand? Also on this, like, I'm going to relate, I'm going to use like um, my relay race uh, metaphor. I kind of see this as like the influencers starting the race. They're like right at the upper funnel, they've got the battle and they're kind of driving this awareness and building hype and relatability and proximity to your brand. At the point in which the customer interacts with that call to action, the baton is then passed to the brand. So if your landing page or your brand Instagram page is kind of crusty and not exciting or doesn't have anything relevant to the campaign that kind of turn that customer into this like interest and decision stage of the funnel then you're going to lose that customer and then you end up kind of losing a portion of budget that you've invested in this campaign so have a think about that kind of relay process if you are driving customers to a certain landing page or an Instagram make sure that you're also investing time and budget into making that landing page a good place for them to want to be. 
regarding call to action, don't forget to pay for the swipe up opportunities on Instagram. For some reason, it is such a hard sell to get brands to book the story packages with their influencers, but it is easily the most measurable way to see an influencer's immediate impact. So pay for it. And if any yeah. influencer will tell you that their stories are their number one source of engagement, just do it. <laughs> definitely and you can see the insights you can ask them to share them um yeah just because an instagram feed post technically lives longer than an instagram story doesn't necessarily mean that more people are seeing it and as we know the way that the algorithm works that actually the i would say the feed post half-life is just as long as the stories anyway so um yeah if you want a link you need to get it in stories and be willing to pay for it <laughs> So on the call to action topic, again, we don't want to overcomplicate this process. Um, too many call to actions are going to dilute the message. They're going to confuse the influencer and the customer. You don't want them to be like swipe up to sign up and also buy before Friday and also make sure you're following us over here and use the right hashtag. It's too much. Pick one, I would suggest, like really clear call to action, which feeds into the exact KPI that you need to drive. So whether that's, you know, if you want to build hype, then you need to have a link that will sign up to your data capture page. If you want to grow followers, then tag the brand and go and follow. If you want to increase your web traffic, swipe up to shop. Um, just have a think about kind of make it KPI forward and then give one call to action in the brief that the influencer can then deliver to their audience. This one's probably quite, <laughs> um, quite divisive, but um, it's something I very strongly believe that you are the client and not the director in this campaign. A common misstep in influencer briefing is brands over prescribing the creative that they are expecting. You've chosen this influencer because they're the expert in creating content. They know their audience better than anyone else and what engages them. Um, every influencer in their audience is completely unique relationship and um, as you've seen from the insights we've shared already, you know, the kind of performance that each influencer will see by channel, by audience um, is completely different. So how could you possibly dictate to them what is the best content to drive engagement and interaction? You are the expert in the product and the campaign and the way that your customer typically reacts once they land on your pages, but the influencer is the expert in everything else. Gio, how do you feel about asking influencers if you can approve their content before posting it? I would typically um, build one revision of the content into the contract. Um, I don't think that you need more than that. Um, the purpose of the revision should be to check the correct use of disclaimers, of links, and um, to make sure that kind of everything's legally compliant, basically making sure that the brief has been met. If it wasn't in the original brief, then you can't expect to see it in the edit. And actually, if you're asking for things to be changed in that revision process, which you didn't put in the brief, then you should be paying for a reshoot. Their job is to follow the brief that you give. So, uh, yeah, you should be willing to pay more. If the revisions that you have at this point are to police the tone or the look and feel of the content, then you've chosen the wrong influencer and you should have used someone else to begin with, personally. It's okay if you feel attacked by this. I did too. I used to work in direct to consumer influencer marketing. And I was like, uh, it reminded me of a few times where I really wanted to ask for a reshoot, but I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> so this is a real life example of an actual live brief that I need to personally deliver on by the end of the month. Um, but I really wanted to share it because it is truly the perfect example of a brand being the director. And as you can see in the far right hand corner. This is page five of 10 pages in this brief. Uh, but this is the one where um, we talk about the video content suggestions. And I, um, I, I felt like I really had to share this one. So for a product launch, I am asked to participate in, I've basically been asked to be an actress, pretending to scroll through a brand's selection online and recording that, screaming and shouting when the product arrives, and then modeling it. As the TikTok trend goes, you would do it too for a check, but this brief is anything but brief. Um, and it's actually pretty extreme. And for context, this is 
after a year of working with this brand. So I am not, uh, this is not my first campaign with them. It's roughly my fifth and it's clearly very extreme. Yeah. Very prescribed, very detailed. It doesn't show you as, um, as a creator or it's yes. not kind of native to your channel at all. Yeah. So if this um, looks familiar, <laughs> you may be who yeah. we're talking to. Maybe we need to dial it back a bit. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry if that brand is on this call, by the way. I didn't consider that they actually They're definitely might not. That. They're definitely not. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so to clarify, what we do definitely want to include in the brief um, is concise information about the product and how to use it. So what are the key ingredients and actives? Um, what are the key features of the product and why they're important? Um, what information do we need to know about the launch? You know, is this the first ever of its kind? Is it on offer for, you know, the next 48 hours? how the product should be used or demonstrated so if it's a face mask for example then it needs to be left on for 10 minutes and then rinsed off um if it's an electronical device you know make sure all of the covers are removed before switching it on this is where your expertise lie as a brand and your job is to brief in exactly what and nothing more than exactly what you want the influencer to be able to translate to their audience um, about the product and how to use it what we definitely don't want is a storyboard um, or heaven forbid a frame by frame shot list as Mackenzie just showed in the brief that she received. Uh, we don't want a script beyond the key messaging and the product details and we don't want direction on setting, background, sound, wardrobe, you know, all of these things that um, unless it's very specifically relevant and critical to the campaign. So for example, um, if you want to repurpose the content and you've built into your contract that it's going to be repurposed onto paid social, then you can um, dictate that the sound needs to all be royalty free um, so that it doesn't get flagged or need to be reshot for the ad purpose. Um, if it's a hair campaign, you know, make sure your hair looks fly in every post. That's fine. But you shouldn't be dictating all of these kind of the mise-en-scene of the content. Um, unless it's specifically relevant, because again, if you um, if it's the kind of look and feel of the influencer's content that you don't like or don't feel is relevant to your brand, then you shouldn't be working with that influencer at all. Um, to achieve the results that you want from a campaign, as we've said, you need to first decide what it is that you actually want to achieve, um, then ensure that you are arming your influencer with the detail that they need to bring that to life. The most powerful brand partnerships are exactly that, they're partnerships, they're a collaboration. You see a lot of the time, you know, influencers will receive DMs from brands being like, hey, we'd love to collab. Uh, and then I feel like the word collab just then drops off and suddenly it becomes like a dictatorship. So um, in short, if you want to have detailed control of the content, then you should be producing it yourself uh, rather than calling upon the services of an influencer. That's not what this industry is for. Also bear in mind, if you are one of those people that sat there like, do you know what? I will go and shoot it all myself. That's fine. Um, but remember that it's been proven time and time again that influencer content outperforms brand content in a social capacity. So your budgets are probably far better placed in the hands of an influencer who understands the social channels and their audiences versus, you know, hiring a studio and a crew. So the good news is, is that most influencers are more than happy to sell the rights to their photos and create additional content for your page. It's significantly cheaper than paying, or I guess inexpensive is probably a better word. It's never really cheap to partner with influencers than paying a creative agency. And as you can see, it significantly outperforms. So if you really want that close up shot of Chriselle Lim holding a perfume bottle up to her face in a light pink dress in a field, you can pay for it. Just don't ask her to post it and trust that she understands her audience and what they're going to respond to. Yeah, genuinely. And I think with all of these topics, actually, um, like trying to encourage the influencers to push back. It sounds odd, but I think a lot of influencers are so afraid of rocking the boat or damaging relationships with brands that they'll agree to go along with something just because you've prescribed it and knowing that they don't feel comfortable with it. I've had so many conversations with influencers 
who are like, oh, I knew that wasn't going to go well on my Instagram. It's like, why didn't you tell the brand before? And they're like, oh, I was scared, you know, that they wouldn't want to do the partnership anymore. Um, I think by kind of opening up those conversations and, and building that into the rapport that you have with the influencer, that you really value those insights and you want to know, like, is this something your audience will respond well to? Is this channel a channel that's performing well for you with this sort of content? Um, you're, you're getting so much more value than you would, you know, just working with a studio crew. Um, you're getting all of these insights. So definitely use them because I don't think those conversations are happening enough. And then on to the kind of less sexy part, but this is actually my favorite bit. If you've ever sat through any one of my uh, law courses on influence marketing, then you'll know that I get weirdly passionate about this. But um, the chances are that you've come across in, you know, some of your other advertising capacities, um, what your product claims regulations are, or um, what approvals you have or disclaimers you have around the products that you're launching. So hopefully you already have that information when you're going live. Um, a lot of people don't then translate that into their influencer briefs. The problem is that you, you know, your brand reputation is on the line, the influencer's reputation is on the line, um, you put yourself um, at risk of um, being called up by like being put on audit or even put on blast in the press if you mess this up and the influencer doesn't know what those regulations are this isn't their expertise at all so this is definitely um, if there is anywhere in your brief that you are to be over prescriptive I would um, hope that it's in the kind of legal department so the sort of legal guidelines that um, I would expect every brand to include and it will be kind of it will vary by industry as well so go away and kind of have a look at the industry that you're in speak to your legal and reg teams internally and try and get like that process approved just so that it's kind of specific to you but in general include the phrases that they need to avoid so um, if, for example, we're talking about um, a hair product, um, I know in the UK and the US, you can't in advertising use language such as my hair grew longer or my hair is so much healthier. It has to be a um, more evocative terms like my hair feels or my hair looks or I've been getting so many compliments. But make sure that you're really explicit about what they can and can't say and give them examples of kind of like safe phrases. Uh, because again you don't want to receive that kind of first draft back of the content and it's full of all of these like really wild claims that you know are just never going to fly in an advertising capacity. In the same way um, the information about uh, relevant restricted categories in your market so uh, prescription products, alcohol consumption regulations, sugar tax. Um, I know in this country we have a lot of regulations on sugar products which a lot of brands don't know about. Um, gambling restrictions, all of these things, you should know if they're kind of relevant to your market, but the influencer doesn't. You want relevant um, examples of the responsible portrayal of your product. So again, um, you know, if it's a mascara advert, you don't want them to be using false lashes. If it's a hair, if it's like a shampoo that is supposed to make your hair grow better, you don't want them to be using extensions in their after content um, even if it's not in your specific market illegal for them to do that in an advertising capacity I would say just from an ethical and moral standpoint you want to have that transparency with the audience so um, I would encourage them and again be explicit in the brief like don't do these things you know in this product capacity and then the disclaimers so uh, if possible I would encourage working with your um, advertising authority in your local market to get actually approved phrases for this purpose and you know they're quite willing to help they'd much rather you get it right first time than them having to like audit the content after it's gone live but um for example all posts must contain the following caption please enjoy responsibly and check out www.alcoholguidelines.com or whatever and just make sure that they're including that in their caption or you know find out more on this website um, these are the sorts of things that you can get approved by the advertising agency and then you can include it in the brief and you know that you're protected the influence is protected they know exactly what is considered compliant and no one's going to get in trouble basically you're the expert in what is and isn't safe to say about your product um, and influence it isn't so you need to protect everyone by including this in your briefs
All right. So to wrap up, the operative word here is brief. By keeping your briefs brief, you ensure that nothing is missed. And by collaborating with your influencer instead of dictating them, your campaign stands the strongest chance of success. It's as easy as recalling elementary school information. Remember the who, what, when, where, and why of your influencer campaign. Influencers that are organic advocates of your brand that create highly engaged content will always be the best partners. And finally, you are the client, not the director, except when it comes to the legal stuff. I think that this mantra is definitely one that you all should memorize and repeat to yourself every time you're coming up with a campaign. So I'm so happy we are a little bit shorter than we thought we were going to be, um, which means we have time for some questions. And if you aren't already a member, we definitely invite you to join the Influencer Marketing Collective. It is our Facebook group where we're always having interesting conversations about influencer marketing. And on that note, let's answer some questions. Oh, Gio, this is a, a good question for you, actually. So this is coming from Caitlin Milliot, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right because I actually know her. So I work for a car company and we do have specific rules about what can be in photos, i.e. your car has to be parked legally. You can't take photos slash videos while driving. And I struggle that with that balance of creative freedom, but following the literal rules of the road. Last year, I had an influencer send a set of photos where the car was obviously illegally parked in the middle of the road and we couldn't use it. Any advice on how to get all your company rules across in a friendly manner? I mean, to be fair, like, that is a great question. Um, I think it's hard to make it friendly when it comes to kind of the legal side, because like, what you don't want is to kind of make it seem like it's not very important because it's all fluffy and nice. Um, I normally separate the legal guidelines and kind of almost make it look like that's like a whole different part of the brief. So the bit at the top is kind of like the fun, like the product, how to use it. And this is why it's important. This is the link we want you to use. And then underneath, it's like, a, by the way, this is super important for you to understand. And then having all of those legal guidelines in there. And um, you could even include, you know, the kind of make sure that you're using hashtag ad correctly and things like that. Just put all of the kind of less sexy stuff in that box. Um, and then just make sure if it's the um, agent that you're talking to, you can like have a more serious conversation with them about how important that part is. Um, and you know you don't have to be as like fun with it or if you are working with the influencer directly it can be sort of like a, an aside that's like oh by the way I know it's super boring but um, I just don't want any of us to get in trouble I, I just want to make sure that you're being protected so if you could just make sure that you've read and understood that bit um, then we're all good to go and it, you know you can kind of make it like a, oh it's not really my fault if it was up to me we wouldn't have to do it but you know it's someone else's issue but it's still an issue. <laughs> Commiserating is always a good idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is coming from Karen Haggerty. She wants to know, do you share the brief with the influencer first, gain their approval and acceptance, and then give them an agreement to sign? And is the brief in a PowerPoint form format? She's always put it in an email in bullet format. Karen, you're doing it right already, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say like, you, you don't have to give so much information up front like as long as yeah those kind of basic points like the influencer knows what it is that's going to be asked of them are agreed um I also try and get as much of those things in the contract as well so actually at the point where they're signing they know exactly what it is that they're agreeing to and signing so I know I'll include like when we want the content to go live um you know the channels that we want to use etc in the contract and then when it comes to the actual briefing stage hopefully as I said like none of it's a surprise it's just kind of putting it all in one place so that they've got something to refer back to when they're creating the content but yeah it doesn't it can be in any format whatever works for you <laughs> so uh, this is a good question this is coming from um Daniela and she wants to know um I think it's I think her last name is pronounced um Sumani so is it important that the briefs look visually nice uh, I've seen it done, you know, both ways, like very formal and very like fun. I'd say as long as it's kind of concise and it's hitting all the right points, it doesn't really necessarily have to look that good. If you've got like a cute template that you can just reuse every time. Um, some of the brands that I represent now 
their their brief is very branded and for others it's very plain um it, yeah I think yeah, it's up to you don't waste time on it if it's um I think it's more important that the content itself is really clear and um and concise but yeah it, it can be cute that's fun make it cute <laughs> <laughs> um how so this one I'll answer so Ali Aiello wants to know um how long is the typical influencer slash brand relationship so the longer the better <laughs> the long-term uh -huh. influencer relationships consistently outperform those that are one-off or um you know maybe just a handful of activations with the same influencer if an influencer starts to become synonymous with your brand uh, on their end, as like, you know, I, an example I think of is great. Sack would partners with Dunkin' Donuts and she is a huge fan of Dunkin'. She tried to get them to partner with her for years by posting content with their product. And then now that they do partner together, it's having a Dunkin' Donut, it's coffee is part of Grace's brand. They should never terminate that relationship. Mm -hmm. But an example of a time where it might be right to terminate. So I worked for a gourmet food company and we sold caviar and I worked with this one influencer about four or five times. And she, her name was Davina and she created incredibly great content. But at some point she came to me and she goes, you know, I don't really think that I can promote caviar anymore. Cause I just think it's okay. And I was like, you know, I think that this, I think even though your imagery is beautiful, I think our time here has ended. Um, so, you know, there's, there's usually a good uh, time to leave a relationship and it'll be usually pretty obvious, but the longer, the better. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think actually you want the period leading up to the point where you sign a contract to be quite long as well. Um, I think if the relationship is like, hey, we want to do a campaign with you, we've got money and they go, hey, okay, I'll take the money if that's kind of the extent of those conversations, then you might not actually have someone who's a great brand fit. You want to make sure that they've actually used the products and have used them for long enough to form an opinion on them. Um, I normally would give it at least a month from the point at which I introduce a brand to an influencer and the point where we start discussing um, a contract and a brief, because I want to know that actually they genuinely love the brand and they have started incorporating it into their lifestyle before we even start discussing contracts. So this is a great question coming from Natasha Gori. Um, hi, I work in the music industry. And of course, we are focusing on TikTok for a lot of our campaigns for song integration. Do you have any advice for briefing TikTokers on using your music? I think with TikTok, it's really hard because um, a lot of people are kind of chasing this virality and virality in kind of its very nature is something that happens organically and naturally. I think working with people who have experience, like, you know, taking like Gen Z TikTokers who have experience in making something really cool and like leading those trends, you're much more, you know, use them on kind of like a consultancy basis. Even if you want to get some of them in to do like a, a review panel with you or something before you even start planning um, those briefs, like people don't use influencers for things other than just posting content, which I find crazy because they are the experts in their, their market. Um, but yeah, I like definitely try and learn from them and what works for them and kind of allow them to use your content as natively as possible and as organically as possible to them and their channels rather than I think that's a great example of where a brand should kind of step back is if you want them to use your, your music very specifically, then you might not know actually the best way for them to do that where it would be cool and go viral. It's a great answer. I wouldn't have thought of the focus group basically. So Ellie Tyrell wants to know if we have any advice when it comes to briefs for gifted campaigns. So I'm going to answer this just because I'm a micro influencer. So I've been a participant in many gifted campaigns. So as little as possible. If you're, if you're doing something in exchange for a gift, unless you are Dior and you're giving me a $1,500 bag, you almost can't even guarantee that you're going to get a post on someone's feed. You can ask if someone will post a genuine review to their Instagram story and like hope that they post something to their feed. But unless the, unless your product is, has like multiple hundred dollar value, it's, too much to ask an influencer to post for free because influencers should get paid and actually, I would say as well actually the regulations are quite um talking about law I find a way to like segue law into law. All of these yes. conversations. 
<laughs> but um, I know like the ASA in the UK and the FCC in the US especially, um, if you are, um, if there is a payment in kind and product counts as payment in kind, you know, you are giving something in exchange for a deliverable, then you have to have a contract in place that clearly outlines exactly what you're expecting. Um, because otherwise there's absolutely, yeah, there's no way to actually guarantee that they're going to create the content. They're not obligated to create content at all unless they've signed a contract that says, I will create content, this specific piece of content on this day, you know, in reaction to that gifting. But, um, but I'm also very much team pay. I think gifting should be a relationship builder and a way to get product into the hands um, of people to see if they like it. But um, I wouldn't necessarily consider things as um you know i always say like moisturizer doesn't pay rent you know this is their job at the end of the day so um consider opening up your budgets or you know repurposing some of your budgets to paid campaigns where you can guarantee and you can have that creative control over the content so we are running we have so many questions i feel so thankful that everyone's so engaged but we do need to just probably pick two more um but i think that this is a really good question that not a lot of people know the answer to um so i think that it would be beneficial for us to answer it so jennifer cook wants to know what would you say is the general benchmark for usage rights on influencer content so yeah this is quite a big topic actually um and again probably one that as you say people don't talk about enough like usage i think usage from my personal experience should be built into every contract and you should be willing to pay a bit extra for usage. Um, typically the flat kind of basic usage is just organic reposting rights. So, you know, we can put the content that you've posted on our own channels, but we're not gonna, you know, change it in any way. We're not gonna put um, an ad spend behind it. But um, definitely like, we know the content performs well and you've already paid to have it created. So why wouldn't you pay extra to then be able to use it in your, you know, pay campaigns um, globally. I, I've used social content on point of sale. You know, I've used social content in cinema and out of home. So um, yeah, the sky's the limit with, with this sort of content and it does resonate with audiences, if, you know, depending on the audience that you're trying to reach. But, um, but I think it's something you should like build in as early as possible. And also, sorry, I'm giving really all answers, but <laughs> so, so it's such a good question. Um, something that I also try to encourage influencers to have is kind of like a usage menu so um you know if you wanted to use my content on out of home then it would cost this much if you wanted to use it and paid on a cap of one thousand dollars it would cost this much on a cap of ten thousand dollars it would cost this much and then it means that throughout the course of that campaign you can then dip back in as the brand and say actually i know we don't have any more deliverables but i know exactly how much it will cost if we want to use that content on paid so let's get that budget and get that agreed with the influencer and you know, it kind of keeps the momentum of the campaign and the relationship. So we have time, I think, just for one last question um, that I actually am curious to your answer on. It's coming from Anonymous. Oh, so, the mystery. And I'm so sorry if we can't get to all your questions. I'm going to do a post in the Influencer Marketing Collective, um, which is our Facebook group. So if you had any questions that didn't get answered, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, how do you prevent an influencer from working with a competitor? can you uh, build, definitely build exclusivity into the contracts that you have um some influencers will be much stricter on the exclusivity clauses than others um you have to remember as well that when you're paying for exclusivity what you're paying for is to take that influencer off the market so um if you're not paying them very much you know if you're giving them like say a thousand dollars for a post um, they could earn another $3,000 from working with another brand in your category that same month. So if you're asking them to be exclusive to you for the whole month, but you're only giving them a thousand, they're missing out on three times that much. So kind of think about it from their perspective as well, when they're kind of hardballing you, but, um, definitely pay extra for exclusivity. I don't think you should expect the influencer to want to be exclusive beyond the term of the contract. So say if you're having the content uh, what month are we in now? March. So if I had a content going live today on the 17th of March, I could say um, we want another stories to go live next Sunday. And then after that, you know, the exclusivity clause is closed. Um, if I really wanted to pay extra for them to not work with another brand, then I should pay extra for that. Uh, it's usually an unwritten rule that they wouldn't want to anyway, just for their own kind of integrity. Like, you know, this is my favorite mascara. Now this is my favorite mascara next week. 
Um, but that isn't something you can guarantee unless that's built into your contract and you've paid for it, basically. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Shio. Thank you everyone that attended. I wish we had time for more questions, but we promised 45 minutes and we are over. We are over time. Um, we invite you to join the Influencer Marketing Collective by Tracker. It's our Facebook group. I will be on there in just a moment to accept any requests. Gio, you're such a delight. For those of you who are looking to you know, partner with an, an influencer expert, uh, Happy Cat Agency is Gio's agency. And Gio is the queen of telling really hard truths, spilling the tea and <laughs> leveling up your brand. So we're really lucky that she was here to partner with us today. Thank you so much. I, I as you know, I can talk about this all day. So, and I did. Sorry, I'm sorry for running over. <laughs> but thanks so much for having me. It's been my absolute pleasure. Absolutely. And for those of you who are looking for a recording of this webinar, I saw quite a few in the chat box who were like, how can I send this to my brand partner? How do I send this to a client? We will have a recording available for you uh, most likely tomorrow. And you can send it to whoever you think needs to hear these hard truths. All right, everyone have a wonderful day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah.